Okay, so, so far we have learnt to treat the Dirichlet series as an analytic function in the region or the half plane of convergence. Now, we want to exploit this point of view. So, in particular, I also want to recall what could possibly happen when you try to pull this function to the left of the region of convergence. Now, as an application of partial summation, so the other thing I want to recall is suppose you have an arithmetic function such that n less than or equal to x f of n the partial sums up to x of that arithmetic function is O of x raised to the delta for some delta greater than 0 then your sum can be written as the integral s times 1 to infinity of a of x over x raised to the s plus 1 ds in the region where this converges. So, if real part of s plus 1 minus delta is greater than 1. If you can ensure that, then this inner term is O of, uh, so you have uh, 1 over x raised to the 1 over something which is O of x raised to the s plus 1 minus delta. So, if you can ensure that that is greater than 1, in other words, that is, if real part of s is greater than delta, then this sum can be written as this uh, infinite series. And in particular, as an application for this, you showed that, suppose I take f of n equal to 1, okay. Then, what happens is you can write the zeta function okay, in the region where real part of s is greater than delta. So, what is delta here? So, note that a of x which is the partial sum, this is our notation f of n, n up to x, this is just so, it is O of x, right. So, this turns out to be equal to s times 1 to infinity and then you can write this as 1 over. So, you can write your greatest integer as x minus its fractional part. So, you have 1 over x to the s ds plus actually minus s times 1 to infinity fractional part of x over x raised to the s plus 1 dx 
And now notice what is happening here. This term just becomes s over s minus 1. And here what you have is, so this uh, fractional part of x is certainly bounded above by 1. So you have an integral which is O of 1 over x to the sigma plus 1, where sigma denotes the real part of s. And you will observe that this part converges when real part of s is greater than 0. So what you have is a function, this integral represents a function on s which is convergent or which is analytic more particularly in the region where real part of s is greater than 0. So, what you have done is, so this can be written as, so s minus 1 plus 1, so you have 1 over s minus 1 plus 1 minus s of something, let us call it g of s, which is convergent and which is rather analytic in the region when real part of s is greater than 0. What this means is that you have analytically continued your zeta function which was initially defined for real part of s greater than 1 to a region which is real part of s greater than 0. So thanks to partial summation you have been able to successfully pull the region in which your zeta of s can be treated as a nice complex analytic object to the left. First you just had real part of s greater than 1 and then you pulled it to the left. Now it is no longer looking like a Dirichlet series in this region but it is a nice expression and you will observe that it is analytic everywhere on complex plane except at the point s equal to 1 where it turns out to have a pole with a simple pole with residue 1. And so, so this tells you that this is an important property of the zeta function. The residue at s equal to 1 is just equal to 1. Okay. So, here are the two things you have learnt so far um, which combine two facts. So, you are trying to combine all the techniques that you have studied till now. One is of course the technique of partial summation and the other one which is very all encompassing philosophical approach is to learn to treat your Dirichlet series as an analytic object, it may not be analytic everywhere, okay, so at, as an analytic object at the points where it is analytic. Now as a quick application, not a quick actually a very very deep application of this uh, idea of relating the partial sums of an arithmetic function to its Dirichlet series, we learn the following technique. So recall, a very beautiful formula in complex analysis which says the following. So first you have this lemma and the Perron's formula follows from that. So this lemma is, suppose you have this function, let delta of x, let it be equal to 1 if x is greater than 1, it is half if x is equal to 1 and it is 0 if x lies between 0 and 1. Okay, and we, we learnt in our live session and of course you can also refer to Apostle's book, uh, this is one of the sections in chapter 11. To verify this formula, it turns out that for any, so I am going to write an effective form of this formula. Let us take C to be positive, let us take capital T to be positive, then the this function de delta of x 
can be expressed as a complex integral. So, this integral is 1 over 2 pi i times integral c minus i capital T to c plus i capital T. Okay. And so, what you have is the function x raised to the s ds. Okay. In fact, uh, okay, let me first write the effective form. The difference between these is bounded above by the following. So, if x is not equal to 1, then you have x raised to the c over capital T times absolute log x. And if x is equal to 1, then you just have O of c over capital T. In fact, this is not just less than less than, this is a precise inequality. So, what happens here is now, as t goes to infinity, then this term will go to 0, x to the c over absolute log x is something that just depends on x. So, you have some x and you let capital T go to infinity, this becomes 0 and similarly for the case when x is equal to 1. And therefore, what this tells you is that your delta of x turns out to be exactly equal to the integral going over the infinite vertical contour from c minus i infinity to c plus i infinity. For any, you can choose c to be any positive number. Now, you will recall when you were learning complex analysis and particularly complex integration, there, was, there were several real integrals that you learned to evaluate by with the help of complex integration. So, if you were trying to, for example, integrate some function which looked a bit weird, but let us say you were trying to evaluate over the real a part of the real line, then what you did was you drew a contour on the complex plane, evaluated the integral over this contour, applied your Cauchy residue theorem and then you tried to understand what, how does the function actually behave over this part. So, if you know the function over the entire contour which can be expressed in terms of residues inside and you can somehow bound the function over this part, then you will know how the function, the in integral of the function behaves over the real part of this contour. You can do the same thing, you do not necessarily have to have a semicircular contour, many a times you also draw rectangular contours. Okay, this is also a closed contour and the integral of this function is equal to the sum of the residues inside of the given function and you take it from there. So, this is the idea that we want to exploit today. This is how you obtain this inequality. Basically, what you have is an integral okay, from c minus i t to c plus i t. You learn to push it to the left or to the right depending on the case. So, let us say you push this to the left. Okay, let us say this is 1, c is something which is greater than 1 okay? and you push it little bit to the left of 1. Suppose you have a function which only has residue at the point s equal to 1, sorry a simple pull at the point s equal to 1, you calculate the residue there and therefore the integral of that function over this closed contour is exactly equal to the residue of that function at s equal to 1 and then Finally, what you do is then you estimate these parts of the contour. You see 
how controlled they are and then you express the integral that you are after in terms of the residue which is what gives you the main term delta of x plus the remaining part of the contour estimate for the remaining part which gives you the error term. So, this is this is a game that you have to keep playing in several problems in analytic number theory and this idea of contour integration is what we are going to use to also prove the prime number theorem. No course in number theory whether it is analytic, probabilistic, algebraic is complete without a proof of the prime number theorem. So, we are going to and there are many ways to prove the prime number theorem. We are going to prove it using the method of contour integration. So, in particular Perron's formula is the following formula. So, as an application of the lemma we do the following, we have the following. Now, let us take x to be something which is not a natural number, ok. So, without loss of generality, suppose you have f of n, you will see that this is actually not such a restrictive condition, but it makes our calculations a little easier. This is same as n less than x f of n. Okay. So, because of this, so notice when n is strictly less than x, then x over n is strictly greater than 1. So, delta of x is 1 in that region. Okay. Then what you do is you choose a c. So, let c be some number such that so, let c be greater than 0 such that summation absolute f of n over n raised to the c is finite. In other words, your Dirichlet series converges absolutely at c, okay, or for any point on the complex plane whose real part is equal to c. That is so, your capital F of s is absolutely convergent for real part of s equal to c. So, rather what you are saying is that your c lies in the half plane of absolute convergence of your Dirichlet series. If these two conditions be true, then for any capital T positive, you have the following summation n less than or equal to x f of n minus 1 over 2 pi i integral from c minus i capital T to c plus i capital T capital F of s x raised to the s ds. This is bounded above by an error term which comes from this term here. So, this is less than less than summation n going from 1 to infinity of absolute f of n x over n raised to the c times 1 over capital T times absolute log of x over n. Okay. And now the question is how to exploit this error term to give us nice effective estimates. But before that, we also want to understand now what happens as capital T goes to infinity. You cannot just do term by term limits here 
because first you have to understand the nature of this term. So what we do is, so to study, what happens as t goes to infinity, let us just concentrate on the error term and let us do the following. Let us write the error term as first n less than x of the sum of n x over n raised to the c times 1 over absolute log of x over n. Okay, put bring 1 over capital T outside. Okay, plus you have 1 over capital T again bring that outside but now you have a remaining part of the sum which is not a finite sum. So you have absolute f of n x over n raised to the c 1 over capital T times absolute log of x over n. Okay, now the first part is not going to create a problem because it is a finite sum. I am going to assume that x and t are independent of each other. So at let, let us, we are trying to look for estimates for n up to x, fine. We have expressed it in terms of this contour integral plus an error term. Now we are breaking the error term into a finite part and an infinite part. Now in the finite part, this is a finite sum. Therefore, as capital T goes to infinity, this part will go to 0, no problems here, okay. But you have the infinite part that you have to take care of. So how do you take care of that? So the finite part goes to 0 as capital T goes to infinity. What do you do for the infinite sum? You observe that if n is greater than x, we are taking n to be strictly greater than x, so if n is strictly greater than x, then n is certainly greater than or equal to 1 plus the greatest integer of x, right? And so, now this absolute of log x by n, since n is greater than x, x by n is something less than 1. Fortunately, we have absolute values. So, this is just log of n over x which is greater than or equal to by the above inequality log of greatest integer x plus 1 over x. And so what you end up getting is thus the infinite sum n greater than x 1 over capital T times absolute f of n over n raised to the c times x to the c over absolute log of x by n is less than or equal to summation n strictly greater than x, 1 over capital T times absolute f of n over n raised to the c times x raised to the c over log of, since now you have this in the denominator, so 1 over log of n by x is less than or equal to this quantity, so log of I 
and you know this is never 0, right? Because x is not an integer. So, what is happening now? What you have is basically this is 1 by t, you can bring the part that does not depend on n outside x raised to the c over log greatest integer of x plus 1 over x times summation n greater than x absolute f of n over n to the c. Now, you know that this sum from 1 to infinity is absolutely convergent. Therefore, the tails are going to 0 and therefore, the tails are absolutely bounded above by something. Okay? This is also something bounded that depends only on x. So, this tells you that as capital T goes to infinity, the infinite sum also it goes to 0. Okay? And so, you are allowed to actually take t going to infinity and what you end up getting is that if you want, you can. So, what, here this was giving you an effective error estimate. So, if you were going in fact from c minus i infinity to c plus i infinity, this actually is exactly equal to 0 and therefore, your partial sum can be written as this contour integral. Where did you use the fact that you want c to be greater than 0? Well, I have s in the denominator here and I want to make sure that 1 over s is analytic in the region where we are. Okay? It, it should not create a problem. That is why we are just taking real part of s to be strictly greater than 0 to ensure that the denominator here will not trouble us. Okay. So, now we go to proof of the prime number theorem. And after we prove the prime number theorem, we are going to delve a little more into probabilistic models related to the distribution of prime numbers. What kind of probabilistic questions can you ask with respect to distribution of the prime numbers? We will address those, but the foundation of all those questions is the prime number theorem. Okay? So, applying this, this result and the effective version of this result to lambda of n, we get the following. So, first of all, what is the prime number theorem? Prime number theorem is the assertion that the sum of the partial sums of the von Mangold function is asymptotic to x as x goes to infinity. And what we will do is we will actually give an effective version of this asymptotic we will show that this partial sum is equal to x plus an error term which is little o of x. We will give an effective error term for the same and we will see how contour integration beautifully enables us to do that. So, sketch of the proof. What are the main ideas in the proof? First idea is of course, you have to associate your sum to so 1 over 2 pi i integral c minus i capital T to c plus i capital T minus zeta prime of s over zeta of s. The Dirichlet, we learnt last time that the Dirichlet series corresponding to lambda of n is exactly this term when real part of s is greater than 1. So, we are going to pick some c which is greater than 1. And apply Perron's formula 
to this arithmetic function. So, you have this plus an error term, which is let us write it down n going from 1 to infinity absolute f of n, which is just lambda of n since lambda of n anyways is a non-negative function. Then you have x by n raised to the c times 1 over capital T into absolute of log of x over n. This is your error term. So, to be able to derive the prime number theorem, we first have to understand this integral and then the residual error term. If we can provide good estimates for both, then we will be able to obtain the prime number theorem. That is the idea. Okay. So, today in today's class, we will in the time that remains, we are just going to focus on this integral part. So, how do you evaluate this integral? Again, you have a vertical contour, you embed it inside a rectangular contour. Okay. So, let me first ask you, so step 2 is to evaluate the integral. To evaluate the integral, let me first just ask you, so here is you have something which is, let me use some colorful chalks today. So, you have something which is greater than 1. Okay. For any c greater than 1, you, you have that integral. And what you want to do is, you want to push it a little bit to the left. Okay. Let us say you push it to some and you, what is the advantage of pushing it to the left? The point s equal to 1 will lie inside this rectangle what is the behavior of this function minus zeta prime over zeta of s at the point s equal to 1. Okay, this is what we are trying to understand. So, recall right at the beginning of this lecture, we saw that zeta of s can be written as 1 over s minus 1 plus some function g which is analytic in real part of s greater than 0. Therefore, suppose you want to calculate zeta prime of s, okay, what you will end up getting is now the order of this pole will increase, right? You will have minus 1 over s minus 1 whole square. So, suppose you were trying to understand the expansion of this around s equal to 1. Where g prime of s is also analytic, right? And therefore, what this tells you is that minus zeta prime of s over zeta of s. If you want to understand the residue of this function at s equal to 1, the behavior of this function around s equal to 1, you have to consider both and by taking uh, this, uh, this expression minus zeta prime over zeta from the way you have written these functions here, you will end up getting that this is equal to 1 over s minus 1 plus some function k of s which is analytic in the region real part of s greater than 0. Okay? So, all we are saying is the residue of the Dirichlet series corresponding to lambda of n 
at s equal to 1 simply turns out to be e exactly equal to 1. Okay? Therefore, if you were to move your line of integration to the left of 1, then this residue will certainly get captured. Now, the whole uh, essence of the proof of the prime number theorem is to move your line of integration just a little, little bit in such a way that your rectangular contour uh, will be there. There will be a rectangular contour containing s equal to 1, but at the same time, no other points, no other points of singularity of this function. What would be the singularities of minus zeta prime over zeta? Certainly, the zeros of zeta of s would create a problem, right? So, we have to move this contour just that much to the left, which will ensure that zeta of s is not zero, okay? And this is how the prime number theorem is related to the study of non-vanishing of the zeta function. Let, let us put this more precisely. So, let me write this theorem to make sense of this expression. This theorem can be proved in many steps and I have shared notes with the class giving details of this theorem, but let, let's at least just understand in a sense what it says. So, it says the following. You can find positive constants Let's call them a1 prime, a3, and you can of course call them anything. I'm just conforming to the notes that I've shared with you. There exist these positive constants such that the following happens. First, if you are in the region, absolute of t less than or equal to 2. So, t always represents the imaginary part of your complex number. So, if absolute of t is less than or equal to 2 and the real part goes a little bit to the left. Okay, So, this is a rectangular region where the real part lies between 1 minus a1 prime to 2 and the imaginary part lies between minus 2 to 2. It's a closed rectangular contour. So, anyways, in this region, so you can find these constants a1 prime, a3 and d such that first of all in this region, you have the following bound absolute of s minus 1 into zeta prime s over zeta of s is less than or equal to, uh, it is absolutely uh, bounded above by this absolute constant d in this compact rectangular region and if not. So, that means if now if you go beyond 2, so when your imaginary part increases, so if absolute of t is greater than or equal to 2 and the real part, now the real part will depend on the imaginary part. Okay. So, if t is some number whose absolute value is greater than or equal to 2 and sigma is greater than or equal to 1 minus a1 prime over log absolute of t raised to the 9, then your 
zeta prime of s over zeta of s would be bounded above by a 3 times log absolute of t raised to the ninth. What does this actually say? So, it says the following. Let me show you. So, you have, so let us say you have your t here, you are choosing some c which is actually very close to 1, but we are putting a microscope, okay, and we are just, we are taking some c. So, what is this lemma saying? It is saying that, and let us say this is your 1 minus a 1 prime. Okay, actually let me move this a little bit more to the left. What this is saying is that, so let us say this is your 2 and this is minus 2, okay. So what this is saying is, suppose you have this region. Okay, in this shaded area, so in the yellow area, your you have the bound given by part A. What happens now? This is this is more crucial. What happens as you have when t is absolute of t is greater than or equal to 2 and when you are saying that sigma is greater than or equal to this. By the way, when you are putting a bound like this, this is basically a very effective and sharp way of saying that zeta of s does not vanish in this region. Okay, you have this behaves like a nice analytic function. Actually, even just what this says is that zeta prime of s over zeta of s is an analytic function in that region with the following upper bound. Okay, now what, what does this inequality here mean? What this means is that as your imaginary part becomes goes outside of the region minus 2 to 2, okay, then you do not necessarily have these non-vanishing results or analyticity of this zeta prime over zeta in big rectangular contours. What you have is, so given let us say you have some big t which is bigger than 2, then All you can say is that there are this this function zeta prime over zeta will be well behaved in this region. So as t becomes bigger and bigger, okay, the region where zeta prime of zeta over zeta becomes well behaved would just be, be in narrower and narrower regions. So as t becomes very very large. Okay, your uh, your contour is coming very very close to the part when real part of s is equal to one because look at the way you have written as absolute t goes to infinity. What is happening to sigma? Sigma will come closer and closer to one since this will go to zero, right? So this is what this contour is actually telling you that. If your imaginary parts are bounded above, below and above by minus 2 and 2, 
then you have a very explicit rectangular region where zeta prime where you have a nice bound for zeta prime over zeta on the other hand if your t becomes larger and larger then the regions where zeta prime over zeta are well behaved they become narrower and narrower they go closer and closer to the line real part of s equal to 1 so with this understanding what now we what we'll do is let us take any capital t we will now choose a contour that will lie inside this so what we'll do is we will choose something very close to s equal to 1 and on the left also we will choose something which is very close close enough to lie in this narrow sort of tunnel okay is this clear so let me draw let me put an even let, let me put the microscope in an even higher focus and let me tell you what kind of contour we are going to draw so let us take this is just this line is just s equal to 1 okay choose a contour let's say capital t let's take minus t okay in such a way that you choose capital t to be greater than or equal to 2 so let's put let's say 2 is here and minus 2 is let's 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 say minus 2 is here okay now with the same length to the left let me draw another rectangular contour okay and let me join it okay let this be let this be t and let me draw okay so what is c and some b we want to make sure that c and b are chosen in such a way that these two inequalities can be applied okay so given theorem one with the choice of a1 prime a3 and d as you take let us choose c to be equal to so we choose c to be equal to 1 plus a1 prime over log capital T raised to the 9. Okay, so T is something very large, it is not 0. Choose this to be C. And what do we choose B? We choose B to be equal to 1 minus a1 prime over log t raised to the ninth. Okay. Why is this choice of b helpful? Because you are saying that if real part is to the right of this number, so if real part is greater than or equal to b, then you can apply this bound. Provided t is greater than or equal to 2. So, the only region, so as long as you are away outside of these two segments of your contour, you can apply the second bound. What happens when you are in these contours between minus 2 to 2? Then you have to apply the first bound. But this is also it can be done because this bound holds uniformly when real part lies between 1 minus a1 prime and 2. But you are choosing b to be much closer. You are choosing b to be 1 minus a1 prime over log t raised to the 9. It is certainly to the right of 1 minus a1 prime. Very much to the right of 1 minus a1 prime. Okay. So, what we are doing is this, this whole argument presupposes 
choice of a large enough capital T and then drawing a rectangular contour with appropriate choices for the real parts. And you have to choose them in such a way that you can apply these bounds that are given to you. So, I will not erase this part. I will just keep this contour and now I will show you how, how to evaluate and estimate the contour that we are after. So, now what we are going to do is note the following. Let us consider the rectangular contour, this one, okay. And let us call this contour R. It is the union of four lines, right. So, where this line is what you are after, C minus I t to C plus I t, okay. So, what you have is first of all 1 over 2 pi i integral over your rectangular contour of minus zeta prime of s over zeta of s x raised to the s over s ds. You have chosen your contour in such a way that other than s equal to 1, there are no problem points, there are no singularities of this function. Therefore, this integral at the rectangular contour is exactly equal to the residue at x as s equal to 1, right? What is the residue of this function at s equal to 1? It is equal to 1 times x to the 1 over 1, right? So, this is equal to x which will give you the main term in the prime number theorem. Okay. Now, we break down the rectangular contour into these four parts, right? So, what do we do? We observe. So, integral c minus i t to c plus i t 1 over 2 pi i integral minus zeta prime s over zeta of s x raised to the s by s ds okay minus x will be equal to 1 over 2 pi i of the integral so, now I will first in order to go from c minus i t to c plus i t, I will first go to what uh, horizontally from c to b, okay, then b minus i t to b plus i t and then back to c plus i t. They will give me the same rectangle, uh, sorry, same value as the uh, integral over this vertical contour modulo the residue which I am taking into account here. All right, so you have for c minus i t to b minus i t plus b minus i t to b plus i t plus integral again b plus i t to c plus i t, okay of this function. Right? Where your b is 1 minus a 1 prime over log t raised to the 9 and c is just 1 plus a 1 prime over log t raised to the 9. So, now if you can give me absolute bounds for each of these integrals 
it will help me to derive error terms in the estimate of the difference between this contour integral and x here. Okay? So, I am going to erase this, but I think by now you understand what your rectangular contour is. So, first what we do is, we estimate the horizontal contours. Okay? So, I take i1 is equal to integral c minus i t to b minus i t of minus zeta prime over zeta prime or oh, sorry zeta s x raised to the s ds and of course there is a 1 over 2 pi i but if you are just taking absolute bounds this will not really play a role. Okay, so what can you tell me about absolute of i1? This will certainly be less than or equal to give me in the region when c your, your imaginary part is capital T and your real part varies from c to b, what is the bound for, can you give me an absolute bound for minus zeta prime over zeta? You can, this is what part b is telling you. Okay? So, what you have is, so I am now, I am not going to worry about the constants. So, what you have is, I am going to take the absolute value of minus zeta prime over zeta outside. Okay? Then you have x raised to the s over s. Okay, what can you say about this? It is certainly, see, c is greater than b. So, at the most, this will be bounded above by x raised to the c. So, you can take that out also. And then you are left with just, what are you left with? You have uh, 1 over s. Okay, which is 1 over square root of sigma square plus capital T square, it is certainly less than or equal to 1 over capital T. Sorry, this is a T, okay, log T raised to the 9 over capital T. And what are you left with? You are just left with the integral from C to B of D sigma. Okay, what can you tell me about this now? This is certainly less than or equal to c minus b, the, the absolute value. So, so, this would be less than less than log t raised to the 9 x to the c over t. And what is this c minus b? c minus b would just be 2a1 prime over log t raised to the 9. I mean, we do not really care about the constant right now. Log t raised to the 9. And lo behold, this log t raised to the 9 just cancels off with the 1 here and you are left with the bound x to the c over capital T. Similarly, I3, let us call this I1, I2 and I3, okay? the other horizontal integral from B to C will also be bounded above by x to the C over capital T. So, the horizontal parts are taken care of, it is the part in the middle, namely the vertical part that we have to be careful about now. Okay? So, let me just show you that as well. So, let me now take integral d minus i t to b plus i t of whatever you are integrating. Now, in this theorem, remember your bounds are different based on whether your t is less than or equal to 2 or greater than or equal to 2. Right? So, what I do is I break this vertical contour into three parts again. 
So, this is first I go from b minus i t to b minus 2 i. Remember, we chose capital T to be greater than or equal to 2. Then next, I go from b minus 2 i to b plus 2 i. And then I go from b plus 2 i to b plus i t. Okay, this is how I break down the vertical integral into three parts. Okay, let us call this no, not a1, um, let us call this b1, b2 and b3. Let us let us see if we can find nice estimates for b1. So, what is b1? Absolute of b1 is less than or equal to you have b minus i t to b minus 2 i of the function zeta prime of s over zeta of s absolute x to the s over s ds, right? Okay, so when t is greater than or equal to 2 and b is satisfying this condition, then you have this bound, right? So, this is what is this less than or equal to 2? What is this? What will you have? So, you can bring this. So, this will just be so b minus i t to b minus 2 i. This is bounded above by a 3 times log capital T raised to the 9. Okay. What about absolute of x to the s over s? You can take x to the b outside, right? This is just x raised to the b, right? Absolute of x to the s is x to the real part of s, which is x to the b. What is absolute of s? It is square root of b square over, yeah. So, let us put absolute of s as square root of b square plus y square, okay. So, what I am doing is I am taking, see this contour only, it is only changing in the imaginary part. So, let us put, let us write y to be the, uh, okay, let us, let us take to our usual notation. Let us take t to be the imaginary part. So, you have square root of b square plus t square, okay. And here you have, it should be actually log of t. As you go from minus 2 as you vary from 2 to capital T, okay, your little t. So, you have this bound, you are just applying your part b and is there something that you are left with? There is ds which is just your dt, right? i dt but in, in the absolute values that all gets absorbed and so what are you left with? You can take x to the b outside. And you can also, so what, what are you left with? 1 over square root of b square plus t square is certainly less than or equal to 1 over t. So, you have basically 2 to capital T, okay. I am taking all, these are all absolute values. Huh? So, you can change the direction also, it will just become negative, but I am taking absolute values. So, what do I have here? Log t raised to the 9 over t dt. What is this integral? It is just O of log of capital T raised to the 10, right? So, this term just becomes x raised to the b times log t raised to the 9 
the same kind of trick you can play with capital B sub 3 as well. Because again, you are going from the region where your imaginary part is greater than or equal to 2. You will get exactly the same bound. What happens in the middle area between minus 2 and 2? That is the last uh, piece of this puzzle. So, B2. You see, this is actually not a very complicated calculation. You just have to do it in. You have to break down your contour into small parts where different, different types of bounds are applicable. So, you go, so again you have integral b minus 2i to b plus 2i of minus zeta prime over zeta of s x to the s by s ds. What happens when your when your imaginary part lies between minus 2 and 2, you have to apply bound A to this. Okay, so this is less than or equal to. Now again, absolute of x to the s is just x to the b. You can take that out. x raised to the b. Okay, then you can also bring out. Uh, so you have basically now b minus 2i to b plus 2i. What is the absolute of zeta prime over zeta? It is less than or equal to d over absolute of s minus 1. Fortunately, uh, s minus 1 is not 0 because you are on the line when the real part is b, which is not 0. So, there is no possibility of this becoming a problem. So, this is d over absolute of s minus 1 okay, times 1 over absolute s times ds. And later again, since you are only varying over the imaginary part from minus 2 to 2, you can essentially treat this as dt. Okay? So, what are the bounds now that you have? It is less than or equal to x raised to the b okay, times d. What is 1 over absolute s minus 1? So, this is 1 over square root of b minus 1 whole square plus y square and the next one is 1 over square root of b square plus y square okay, times or rather since we are using t dt. Okay. So, clearly this is certainly less than or equal to 1 over b minus 1. This is less than or equal to 1 over b. Now, 1 over b minus 1 is O of 1 over b. So, you can just take this out as less than less than x raised to the b over b square into some d which gets absorbed in the constant and then you just have the integral dt from minus 2 to 2 which is again something absolute. Okay, so here you have this nice upper bound. Now b square, since uh, so remember what is b? b was something which is to the left of 1 but very, very close to 1. Therefore, b is certainly greater than a half. Okay, so uh, which means that 1 over b square also has a absolute bound above. So it is absolutely acceptable to just write this as O of x to the b. Are there any contours that still remain? I think we have taken into account all the different parts of the rectangular contour we are with. So, combining all the estimates, what we get is what we have is that summation n up to x lambda of n okay, minus 1 over 2 pi 
integral c minus i t to c plus i t of this function minus zeta prime over zeta of s x raised to the s over s ds okay this is so uh, what you end up getting is that this bit is in fact uh, in actually no what you are getting is so we are yet to come to this part we were just focusing on this right and we showed that this integral is equal to x plus sum of a bunch of other integrals for which we have found nice bounds okay so this part was just x the residue okay this is less than or equal to so what were the different bounds that we obtained we obtained first was x raised to the c over capital t then the other bounds that we obtained were x raised to the b and we also had x raised to the b times log t to the 10 which is clearly bigger than x to the b okay so So, log 10. And your b is something which is strictly less than 1, it is to the left of 1. So, this is certainly less than x. The main, so what you are saying is that this, this is equal to, so saying that this is equal to x plus o of this term. This takes care of the contour integral. The next thing we have to do is, of course, between the partial sum lambda n and this contour, there is also a residual error term. We have to take that into account and combine that with this error estimate here to finally derive the prime number theorem with error terms. We will complete that in the next class. One thing I would like you to observe here is just, just with respect to this contour integral, you seem to have two error terms, one in which capital T is in the denominator and the other one in which you have log T in the numerator. So, if you take T to be, you have to of course make an appropriate choice of capital T to get a good error term. If you take capital T to be very, very big, then this error term will explode. And if you take T to be very, very small, this will be controlled, but this will explode. So, you have to balance your choice between the two. So, you have this error term, then you have another residual error term coming from Perron's formula. In the next class, we will combine them all to derive the prime number theorem in its final form. But I hope today I was able to convey to you the importance of the idea of the method of contour integration in deriving partial sums of nice arithmetic functions. Okay, so to, to go back, uh, I mean to understand this better, please go back and evaluate the integrals for yourself as well. This bound of course, this theorem 1, I am just assuming, I will give you some steps for the proof of this, but today we learned how these bounds lead us to evaluating the complex contour, integral of the complex contour around the point s equal to 1, thereby leading us to the proof of the prime number theorem. So, I will stop on this note today.